Hey, welcome to Alistair. Hi folks. Okay, so uh, as mentioned, my name is Alistair De Silva. You can find me on Twitter as EvilDeese or you can email me at alistair at desilva.org if you have any further questions later on or just find me down in the uh, hallway track. I'm sure I'll be easy enough to spot. Okay, so um, a few years ago we bought a house. Um, this house had a flat roof. Flat roofs tend to leak. Um, and every time I patched one spot, it would leak somewhere else. So um, earlier this year, we decided we'd change the roof. And so um, these were a few shots from the, after our roof was taken off. So we got a lovely view of the night sky. And of course, being in Canberra, we can see all the stars, which was awesome. Um, and of course, one of the things that you can do when your roof is off is get access to all the internal wall cavities. So we thought this was a great opportunity to implement some home automation. Um, so we started researching a few different technologies. And of course, all the popular ones are all wireless because they're really easy to implement. But why not wireless? Well, security, security, security. Who here remembers the WPA2 um, bugs that showed up earlier, or oh, about middle of last year? Yeah? So if that happens in an IoT device and you can't patch the radio in that, then you're kind of screwed. Um, also, things like I've got some wireless picture frames at home that don't do WPA2, they only do WEP, and there's no way I'm keeping around an access point on WEP um, just to keep that hardware going. And so, well, that I can throw out, but if there's something that's integrated into your home, you're kind of stuck with it. So, wireless wasn't that great for us. Um, some other advantages of cabled technologies is that you can also deliver power over those same cables. And well, if you've got good access to your wall cavities, it's not that much of a problem to run cables. So out of all the technologies that are out there, um, we looked at a few. I started playing around with one wire, which is already popular in the home automation space for temperature sensing, if nothing else. Um, it's great because there's very low power requirements. Um, the protocol itself is pretty simple to implement. Um, only takes a couple of tens of kilobytes in firmware. Um, and there's predefined one wire standards um, for um, running one wire over Cat5. So as well as your one wire data lines, you also get um, five volt power, 24 volt power, um, and a whole bunch of grounds. Um, other than that, um, one wire can scale up so you can get many, many devices onto the same bus. And there's lots of existing stuff out there, so it's easy enough to just buy something, plug it in, and start testing and playing around. And well, the other advantage is that it's, since it's a physical cable, you need to compromise that cable if you want to compromise the network. So it's a bit better than wireless, where you can park a van across the road, and um, if you hit the right bugs, then you can take control of those devices. And, who knows, maybe cause an oven to overheat or open a door that you shouldn't have had access to, stuff like that. So the way we decided to wire up our home was uh, for every single light switch or actually every point where a person would be thought of as interacting with the system, we just added a single extra Cat5 run. So every light switch got one and there's a few other points around the place that don't actually have mains but just have a blank cable behind the wall. Um, so just over a dumb Cat5 cable, you've got four pairs. So that allows you seven dumb switches hanging off the end of it. So if nothing else, you can always trunk your switches back to a central location and do your switching there. Um, as I mentioned before, we can run one wire over Cat5. And so my intent is that the majority of the switches in the house will be smart switches of some sort, possibly with status indicators on them. And for the uh, higher use uh, areas, so places like the living room or home theater, um, master bedroom, um, I bought a whole pile of $50 seven inch Android tablets. I got some PoE adapters and a stack of ethernet widgets that I really need to build into a single adapter. And the idea is I can see and see a uh, case for those, mount them on the wall, and have a nice touchscreen interface. Like, there's nice MQTT apps out there uh, for Android. So um, that can then talk to the back end of the home automation, and everything will look pretty. 
So we needed to start cabling. So we did. And then we added more and more and more and more. Um, we ended up with about 160 cable runs in the house and 3.8 kilometres of cat, mostly cat six. Um, and this is only half the house. Um, now, admittedly, most of this wiring is for Ethernet. Well, we tended to run either four or eight runs to each location that we thought we might ever need it in the future. Because um, who wants to run local switches for your home entertainment when you can just trunk it all back to a single large switch? So I don't expect them all to be connected simultaneously, but having the option is nice. Oh, yeah, so that was the final bundle. Um, it works out probably about that thick of uh, Cat 6. Um, so for lighting in the home, um, I ended up going and finding a manufacturer in China who could custom fab some LED strips for me. Uh, the problem is that the majority of strips you can buy um, are maximum of 24 volts. And I really wanted 48 volts because I wanted to do some longer runs and reduce the power losses over that distance. Um, so I found one. Um, there's pretty standard RGBW um, all in one package. Um, and yeah, it took a bit of going back and forth, but we got there in the end. I now have a few hundred rolls of 48 volt LED strips at home that I can control. Um, so a couple of ideas that I've got for these is, um, I've put cool white emitters um, in the strips uh, for efficiency but then we can warm them up by mixing in the red and green emitters and um, bringing that colour temperature down. So at night, it doesn't uh, trigger the uh, circadian rhythm so much. Um, the, another little trick that I noticed with these that I'm quite happy with is that um, LED strips have your, like a 12 volt LED strip will have three LEDs and a dropping resistor. Now, by the time you go to 24 volts, they simply double the number of LEDs and have a dropping resistor. But the amount of voltage dropped over those resistors is now more than what the voltage drop over an LED is. So your 24 volt strips really should have seven LEDs in a section, but they only have six. But when I realized this, I redesigned my strips to give me 14 LEDs per segment. So as well as um, the lower losses um, for transmission, I'm making better use of the energy when it gets to the strip. Um, so to drive these things, I've uh, implemented some LED controllers. Uh, and that's really what this talk is about. Um, so that's one of them up there in the top right. Uh, this is one of my prototypes. This was only a two-channel prototype. The final version has four channels of RGBW. Um, and basically what it is, is it's a little STM32 microcontroller. Um, I have written a one-wire device emulation that runs on the microcontroller so it can masquerade as other one-wire devices. Um, in fact, <coughs> one of the uh, things that uh, I built to test it with um, is to masquerade as a DS2408 chip, which is a general GPIO uh, device. But it costs about $10, whereas these microcontrollers cost $1.50. Um, so if nothing else, it's good just to be able to replace some um, expensive hardware with cheaper hardware. Um, the other cool thing with these controllers is that since the, um, since the device is bus powered, um, I'm not reliant on an external power supply, which means that when no light is being shown, I can power the main power supply down. So that's what that solid state relay on the right hand side of the board is for. Uh, basically has mains control and can just kill power to that power supply. Um, so other devices that I've created include an eight zone 24 volt AC uh, damper controller. Um, I've used uh, um, solid state relays for that as well. And I think that I've got the creepages right in order to do mains if you're silly enough to go and install mains dampers on, but really just use the 24 volt AC ones. It's much safer. Um, I've got a mains controller with uh, four lots of solid state relay outputs and eight switch inputs. So the idea is we've got things like roller shutters in the home that have an up-down control and then have two channels of mains control for moving the motors up or down. 
And so I can basically pull one of our, wall our walls, existing wall switches off, connect them to one of these controllers, and then connect the back end onto the motors for automation control of that. Um, I built another device that I'm calling So Many Switches because it provides 56 switches um, on the one wire bus in one device with a $1.50 microcontroller. Um, so I brought those out to um, eight lots of RJ45 jacks. So each one of those can bring in seven switches, like I was describing before. So if it's a less used room, I can just use a, uh, I can just use an existing um, switch there, bring it in across Cat5 back to the central location, plug it into this, and now that room's automated. Um, and my final device, which is a project that is still in flight because I've fabbed the hardware, but I haven't written the software yet, is a um, one-wire master controller. Now, you can buy one-wire mas masters off the shelf. They're not that expensive, but they only give you one bus each. And for home automation, what I really want to do is have independent controls for each room so that if there's an electrical fault on one bus, it's not going to prevent the rest of the house from working. Um, so I came up with this design. Um, it's based on a slightly different microcontroller with more I.O., um, but it's going to end up giving me 32 RJ45 jacks on the front of it, each one of those with a one-wire bus and 24 volts DC out. Um, so the nice thing about having 24 volts on those buses is that if I want to drive things like blind motors for windows, then there's enough power um, from that at 24 volts, even over Cat5, to run those low power motors. So the device itself is basically an STM32 FO30 microcontroller. Um, it's mostly embed um, for the higher level stuff. Uh, the one wire drivers themselves are written using the STM32 Cube MX um, abstraction layer, uh, mostly for performance reasons. Um, the microcontrollers, as I said, are stupidly cheap. Um, they clocked at 48 megahertz, have 64K of flash and 8K of RAM. Um, and my hardware is all released under the Tapper open hardware license. So anyone can grab my schematics or the board layouts, make changes, fab it themselves if they want to implement this at home. The software driver is structured as a pod device. So basically, in your main loop, you just keep poking it. Um, but when it needs to talk back to you, it's implemented as a listener interface. So uh, because it's all C++, basically what you would do is you write a class that implements the listener interface. Um, and so something that's pretending to be a switch might have an on and an off method. Um, and so then those method implementations are device specific and you can easily implement a device that does something weird without having to go digging through all the protocol code um, that's abstracted away from you. Um, I also ended up writing a set of patches to OWFS, uh, the one-wire file system for Linux. Um, and that basically lets all of my devices show up on your file system so you can then go and poke it with uh, whatever home automation software um, you have. Um, one thing that I'm really proud of, uh, so there's other projects out there which are, are trying to achieve the same thing in the AVR space, and they're actually worth looking at. Um, but one thing I have that they don't is a bootloader. So what you can do is when the device is booted, you can send it a command that says enter firmware update mode, and it'll restart itself, come up and re-enumerate as a flash device. And then you can reflash it over the one wire bus, which means that you're not crawling through your roof space or digging devices out of walls in order to perform upgrades. So what have I learned from this? Well, one wire protocol is timing sensitive. Um, and in a situation where you don't have good access to debuggers and you tend to just throw in printfs everywhere, that can really mess up your timing. Um, in fact, one of the problems that I had was with the uh, device enumeration um, when devices are being discovered on the bus. And um, what happened was I had a printf in a silly place and it took me two months to track it down. In fact, what I ended up doing was buying a logic analyzer 
and then looking at the signals coming across the bus before realizing what the problem was. Um, and basically that uh, little delay, that maybe two milliseconds that the printf took to execute, caused a race condition which meant that my devices wouldn't enumerate if there were other devices on the bus, but would enumerate fine by themselves. Um, so if anyone is interested in actually debugging um, wire protocols, I'll be running a workshop on Thursday uh, where you can get a logic analyzer and a little microcontroller and plug them all together and learn how to use it. And then I've constructed a broken one wire library with some mistakes in it. And you can try and identify what the mistakes are and fix them. So if you're the kind of person who would like to tinker and write your own drivers in the future, then it's not a bad workshop to attend. Anyway, that's my little pitch. Um, the other thing that I've realized is you should really double check your KiCad footprints. Um, as mentioned before, sometimes uh, they change underneath you. Um, the other important point there is just because you fixed one problem with your board doesn't mean there aren't more hiding. So rather than fixing your problem and sending it off to Fab again and waiting for three weeks before the next ones come back, do whatever it takes to get that prototype working and start writing down all your problems and fix them all in one hit and send that off to Fab. Because otherwise you're going to be doing 10 times as many changes as you're going to need. So what's next for me? Um, I need to write the firmware for the uh, device master. Um, in the meantime, as a stopgap, I can always use the um, commercial one-wire devices, one-wire masters that are available. Um, I have to terminate all those network cables. Uh, so at the moment, I've got a big bundle hanging out of a hole in my wall in my server room. Um, and that's going to take a while. Um, so the master and so many switches uh, devices both have a lot of RJ45 ports. Um, it's impractical to 3D print a case for them, at least not in a one or two part design. So I'm going to have to come up with something, probably laser cut, that I can, um, that can hold all that hardware and keep it safe and then also mount in the rack. Um, fabricate the controllers. So, John, you mentioned something last year about the pit of despair in your uh, open in your pick and place talk. Yes. Yeah, that's where I am. You're right in the bottom of the pit. Yeah. So I've got about 50 controllers that I need to fabricate. Um, so I did actually buy a bunch of uh, pick and place hardware, and I bought a uh, large, cheap. Um, la diode-based laser engraver from China that I'm going to use as my XY frame. Okay. So we'll see how it goes. The whole exercise has been an exercise in yak shaving, so it's par for course. And the final thing is um, install all the LED strips. Um, so I found um, from AliExpress some really nice aluminium extrusion that can either fit flat on the ceiling or in the corner along the cornices. And the great thing is that um, the extrusion itself acts as a heatsink for the LED strips. So I've got all my wiring in place for it now. So it's simply a case of mounting those extrusions and then putting the LED strips into them. Um, and of course, fabricating all the controllers and plugging that in. So where do you get it? So all the firmware, uh, PCB designs, um, schematics, etc., are available on my GitHub account. Um, and the patches to OWFS are also available um, under the same account. Um, you particularly want the Inferno embedded branch uh, because that's the branch that contains all the patches. Um, tinkering with OWFS is pretty straightforward. Um, it's not as well documented as it really should be, but I think the same could be said of most open source projects. Um, but if you do want to tinker around and play with your own devices, um, feel free to ping me, and I'm happy to give you some guidance in that regard. And that's about it. So if there's any questions. Yep. yep. So I have one wire at home, and I use some one-wire hubs. Yep. Which 
get six four out of one, yeah. which helps with cabling. So of course, I mean, you're supposed to, you can daisy chain as much as you want, but if there's anything wrong with one, then it kills. It's everything. going to take out that segment. Whereas yeah. with the hub, it actually sends you six different branches, and if one goes bad, the other five keep working. Yeah. Um, so in your case, you just have 32 branches, so you don't need the hub. I will basically have 32 masters right. um, showing up. I'm unsure at the moment whether I'm going to um, show that up in OWFS as a single controller or as 32 independent controllers. But one of the uh, things that I'm planning on doing, which is kind of pushing me down the single controller path, is that um, I can do simultaneous alarm searches across all branches. Um, so the way the one wire protocol works is if so devices can't really talk back. They can only be polled. Um, so when a device has something interesting that it wants to report back, it needs to stick its hands up. And the way it does that is by responding to an alarm search. Um, so what I can do is do that search across all the buses simultaneously. And that search increases linearly with time based on the number of devices. So by having 32 branches, that are all being searched simultaneously, I can significantly reduce the number of uh, amount of time it takes to enumerate those. That's fair. Um, I think it helps with cabling, because I have the same problem with you. Yep. Cabling actually becomes expensive. Uh, those CAT6 cables end up costing quite a bit. Yep. So I found that actually having, even for Ethernet, using a switch on the other side, switches tend to be cheaper <coughs> now than actually running six runs of CAT6 yep. and using a master switch on the other side. Uh, I just found out that way. Yeah, it depends. I ended up buying um, a 48 port gigab like true gigabit switch with PoE for 100 bucks from Orbids. That's not bad. Okay. Um, so that was a pretty good deal, and that certainly pushed me. But the one. Ends up being expensive, yeah, right? yeah. Uh, and so for the one wire code, uh, Arduino obviously already has one wire libraries. Yeah. So outside of doing your own because it's interesting. Well, so it Arduino it? has one wire master libraries. Correct. Not slaves. This is. Oh, the, no slave at all. Yeah. Um, so uh, in my GitHub repo, I've got a fork of uh, the AVR uh, one wire slave implementation as well. Mm -hmm. But that's also bare metal, it's not Arduino. Okay. Yeah. I don't think you could reasonably do it with Arduino. I think it's just too timing sensitive. You really do want low level hardware access to, um, to do that. Oh, there's another question over there? No. Any other questions? Any final questions for Alastair? Yes. Yep. Um, our house often gets issues with lightning and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, how do you protect against that? Well, all my wiring's indoors, um, and we've got a colour bond roof, so it should hopefully not be too much of an issue for me. Um, but yeah, I really should think about lightning protection. Uh, the Master itself um, has uh, um, bypass diodes uh, on the one wire lines, which are effectively short, will short it to ground. It'll probably still kill the master, um, but the slaves will probably survive. I don't know, we'll have to see what happens. <laughs> okay. and, uh, one last question. Uh, my, my parents had some problems with something chewing at Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think actually <laughs> any, anything would be terrified of your cables perhaps. I mean, that's <laughs> yeah, no, there's certainly not much I can do to prevent against a uh, vermin intrusion there. But I mean, the yeah. good thing is that because chili my. Spray. <laughs> Sorry? Chili spray. Right. Well, we actually do grow chilies. Um, <laughs> but uh, so. At least um, if one cable gets gnawed through, it's not going to take out the whole house. It'll just take out the one room that it's affecting. Um, unless, of course, it takes out my internet connection, in which case I have other issues. <laughs> cool. Okay. Thank you Thank very you. much.